it's a great pleasure to be here. I'd like to thank Martin. I think he's maybe stepped out of the room for inviting me along to talk today. Um, I gave uh, a talk here a couple of years ago, and that was really on diabetes overall, and it included both type 1 and type 2 diabetes. But I think you had a, a talk earlier in the year from Dr. Nuala Murphy on type 1 diabetes. So I'm not going to focus much on type 1 diabetes today. Most of my talk will be about type 2. So these are the learning objectives. So hopefully at the end of this talk, you'll <coughs> know what diabetes is. You'll know a little bit about the difference between types 1 and type, type 2. <coughs> and I felt it was, a little, it was important to include that because you'll have had a, a discussion on type 1 already. So type 2, we, we think, is quite a, a different condition to type 1 diabetes. How the different types are treated, but the focus will be really on type 2. The reasons for the current epidemic of diabetes that we've seen over the last 10 to 15 years in Ireland, as in many other countries throughout the world, and what the complications of diabetes are and how they can be prevented. So to ask, what, ask me what is diabetes, this is a definition that we would use when we're teaching our, our medical students. So diabetes mellitus, and by that we mean sugar diabetes because there is another type of diabetes which we call water diabetes, nothing to do with the blood sugar whatsoever. So it's a disease characterized by high levels of sugar or glucose in the blood. And if you were to ask what a normal glucose is, if you fast overnight from midnight to the night before and go to your GP at 8 or 9 in the morning, your fasting glucose should be less than 7 um, to ensure that you don't have diabetes. Okay? So the reason that anybody develops diabetes is that their insulin, the insulin levels are not adequate. And insulin is the hormone or protein in the blood that controls the blood sugar levels and stops it from going high. And it comes from the pancreas. And within the pancreas, there are specialized cells and they're in something called islets of Langerhans. So Langerhans was obviously the person who discovered these. And there's little islets or islands of cells that make various hormones. And the, the most important of those and the one that's predominantly made by the islets is insulin. And as I say, insulin is responsible for, for keeping the blood sugar within a normal range. I'm not sure how well this slide actually projects because the colors are a little bit um, weak perhaps. But basically what you're looking at on this slide is what happens in terms of insulin production over the course of a day in a normal person, a non-diabetic person. So there's no time throughout the day, you can see at the bottom of the slide, that there's no point in the, uh, throughout the day where there's no insulin being made. So you can see that down here there's a continuous slow trickle of insulin coming from the pancreas. And then after each meal, and that's triggered by the, the sugar and other food constituents that we take in in our meal, the insulin production is, is massively increased after each of the main meals. So you can see in this particular case, you're looking at three meals in the day. But obviously if you had more than three meals, you'd have extra bursts of insulin production in response to, to, to the stimulus. So in a nutshell, diabetes means that there isn't enough insulin to meet the body's needs. Okay? And the difference really between type 1 and type 2, so you'll have heard from Dr. Murphy earlier in the semester, type 1 diabetes is due to a total lack of insulin. So people with type 1 diabetes, the cells that make the insulin in their pancreas are completely destroyed. They absolutely have to take insulin to maintain their life, otherwise they'll die. In type 2 diabetes, we understand that the body becomes quite resistant to the insulin that we're making. So you actually can make enough insulin, uh, similar to somebody who doesn't have diabetes, but that insulin doesn't work very well in the body. So the effect of it is blocked. And it's as a result of this resistance, as we call it, to insulin, that the blood sugar eventually starts to, to rise. So people who have diabetes can get symptoms. And that's very often how they present to us as doctors. So it, and it really doesn't matter what type of diabetes you have, the symptoms tend to be the same. You, you may be familiar with those. Everybody, I think, at this stage probably knows somebody who has diabetes. So excessive thirst, excessive production of urine, weight loss, fatigue, blurred vision. They're the common symptoms that people will present to us with. And we can sort those problems, those symptoms out. But in the long term, if the blood sugar levels remain high, there is a risk of other tissues being damaged. And we'll talk a little bit more about what those tissues are and uh, how that can be prevented later in the, in the talk. So if you like, the short-term complications are the symptoms. And if the symptoms are not treated, the person can, come, because of the excess of urine production, the person can become quite dehydrated. And that can, with type 1 diabetes, eventually can lead to a diabetic coma, but that doesn't tend to happen in type 2. When the blood sugar is high, that provides a good environment for any kind of bugs to grow. So anybody with diabetes, particularly if it's uncontrolled, is more likely to develop infections of different types. And then, as I said, the long-term complications, which we'll come back to later on, can damage the kidneys, the eyes, the heart, the circulation, and result in amputations. 
So it sounds kind of scary, but as you'll see later in the talk, the news is not all bad. So there are the symptoms that I've mentioned. Thirst, frequent drinking, frequent urination, particularly at night, somebody who's not used to getting, happen to get up at night to pass urine. If that suddenly becomes an issue, that might be because of diabetes. Unexplained weight loss, fatigue, blurred vision, and frequent skin infections. So if we just do <coughs> a couple of cases to highlight the differences between type 1 and type 2, and then I'll focus really more on the type 2. So this is a case of a young man at 32. He was referred to our emergency department because he had the typical symptoms I mentioned, thirst, making a lot of urine, he lost weight, all in a relatively short period of time over the preceding six weeks. He had no medical history prior to this at all, but he did have a first cousin who has diabetes and was taking insulin. He, noted he was known to be thin and he had a very high blood sugar level, 24.7. So you can see that's well above the level of 7 that I mentioned, which would be the upper limit of non-diabetes. So clearly this man had type 2 diabetes. And with a short presentation that he has, we say he has type 1. So type 1 is about 15%, and as I said, that's due to a total lack of insulin in the body. And type 2 makes up most of what we actually see in the clinic. About 85% of all the diabetes we see is what we call type 2 diabetes. And that's where there's actually plenty of insulin, but it doesn't work very well in the system. Now, whereas patients with type 1 diabetes absolutely have to have insulin, Patients with type 2 diabetes can be controlled for a long period of time with, without insulin, although many of them will eventually require insulin to keep their blood sugars under control. So if we're to look at the differences between type 1 and type 2, generally type 1 comes on at a young age. Okay? So we tend to, as doctors, we tend to associate type 1 diabetes as starting in the teenage years or even sometimes earlier than that, anything up to the age of almost 40. Type 2, we typically tend to associate as occurring or developing in the middle age and elderly, so people in their 50s, 60s, and so on. Although I'd have to say over the last 20 years, the, the margins between those are, are very much blurred. And with the obesity we now see, in, even in young children, we can see type 2 diabetes in, in young age group, and we also see sometimes type 1 in the older population. So the patients with type 1 tend to be slim whereas the people with type 2 are usually overweight or obese. So 85% or so of people with type 2 diabetes will be overweight or obese. Patients with type 1 are less likely to have somebody in their fam immediate family, so in other words, their parents or their siblings who have diabetes. But it's quite common in people with type 2 diabetes. They'll usually at 30% of people with type 2 diabetes will have a first-degree relative who also has the condition. And if you have... For instance, both parents have type 2 diabetes, then you've almost, you have a 70 to 75% chance of developing diabetes. So it's a strong family history in type 2. Patients with type 1 usually have a very short duration of symptoms. So you saw that man's case that I presented to you. He only complained of the symptoms for about six weeks prior to being diagnosed with diabetes. Whereas patients who come to us and di are diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, when we talk to them, very often they'll say, well, you know, I've been feeling tired really for the last two years and I just thought I was getting old or whatever. So those symptoms in type 2 diabetes start, come on very, very gradually. Patients with type 1 can present with a diabetic coma where the blood sugar goes so high that the patients eventually lose consciousness. But that doesn't happen in patients with type 2 diabetes. And in type 1 diabetes, as I said, insulin is required, but it's not necessarily required in, in people with type 2 diabetes. Women who have diabetes during pregnancy, we call that gestational diabetes or pregnancy-associated diabetes, we think of that as being like a form of type 2 diabetes. And although it generally goes away once the baby comes, the diabetes can come back later in life. So that's a risk factor for development of, of, di of type 2 diabetes. So this man presented at a young age. He was thin. He had no immediate family history, although he did have a cousin who had type 1 diabetes by the sounds of it and he had a short duration of symptoms. So all of these pointed to probable type 1 diabetes, and this young man was started on insulin, and thankfully has done quite well. So the treatment of type 1 diabetes, just very briefly, is to give insulin, and that can be given either as multiple injections in the day, or sometimes we use a pump, which continuously administers the insulin over a 24-hour period. And what we do is we try to mimic the normal insulin release pattern that I showed you by giving a mixture of, in black here are long-acting insulins and then in the light blue are rapid-acting insulins. So we give one or two injections of the slow-acting insulin over the day to try and mimic the slow release of insulin that continuously occurs. And then with each meal, the person with diabetes will take a, an injection of the rapid-acting insulin to control the blood sugars after their meals. So that's the usual way we would treat people with type 1 diabetes. You can use a pump 
and sometimes we actually uh, we don't have an islet transplant available in this country, but in other countries it is available. That means replacing the tissue that makes the insulin from the pancreas that has been damaged. You can inject those back into people with type 1 diabetes, and that can work quite well. So I'll stop talking about type 1 diabetes there, and now focus for the remainder of my talk on type 2 diabetes. And this second case, a 45-year-old woman, she was concerned that she might have had diabetes because she had diabetes during a pregnancy before. Uh, during the pregnancy, the diabetes was successfully managed just with diet, and that's very often the case, although sometimes during pregnancy we need to use insulin as well. So lately she's been feeling very tired, but otherwise had no complaints at the time she came, but she was alerted to the fact that she might subsequently de redevelop diabetes again because of her pregnancy-associated diabetes. Her mother and one of her two sisters already have diabetes and they're treated with tablets, so that tells you that they have type 2 diabetes because Type 1 diabetes would not be treated with tablets. She's been overweight since her last pregnancy and has taken a tablet for blood pressure in the last two years. So we commonly find that people with type 2 diabetes, as I said, they're usually overweight or obese, they very frequently have high blood pressure as well. So high blood pressure tends to go along with type 2 diabetes. She was obese and her body mass index was 34.5. That may mean something to some of you. It may mean nothing to others. We'll come back to that in a minute. Her blood pressure was 140 over 90. Now, a normal blood pressure for most of the general population would be 120 over 80. So you can see her blood pressure is a little bit high, even though she's, she's on tablets already. So she had a test done, and her glucose when she fasted was 9.4. So again, that's over the cutoff of 7 that I said means that she's got diabetes. So this woman clearly has diabetes. The fact that she's obese, her very strong family history, she's presenting a little later in life, in her 40s rather than in her teenage years, her previous history of diabetes and pregnancy, all of those point to this woman having type 2 diabetes. So you can see the difference in the, in the type of presentation. So as I said, we think that type 2 diabetes is caused by the body becoming in resistant to insulin. And that probably develops over, this is a, a demonstration of how type 2 diabetes might develop. And up here you're looking at insulin resistance, which progresses over many decades maybe. That period of time over which it progresses can be shorter in some people than others. And in the early stages of insulin resistance, in other words the body becoming resistant to the effects of the insulin, the pancreas makes more insulin. So you can see the insulin level rising here. But eventually it will reach a point where it can no longer compensate for that insulin resistance and the, the insulin rate, production rate starts to fall off. And at that stage the blood sugar levels you can see on the bottom panel start to rise. So this is how we think type 2 diabetes develops, and that process can take, as I said, many decades. Now, how do we treat type 2 diabetes? Well, as I said, not everybody needs insulin. So usually we'll, we'll always start people on a diet. Many of these people require a diet because their diet, you know, they're overweight and their, their diet needs to be re restructured in terms of both the calorie content and also uh, maybe the, the types of food that they're they're taking to help control the blood sugar levels. And we'll also encourage them to take exercise, because very often these people are not exercising at a level that we would consider would be you know, required for most people. Then we'll sometimes start them on a tablet, and the traditional way that we would have managed them is that they start on one tablet, when that tablet no longer works we'll add a second one, and at some point down the line we may add insulin. So everybody is probably aware, if you open the newspapers every week, there's some story about how common diabetes is becoming, and it is very common, particularly the type 2 variety. And we reckon that there's about 200,000 people in Ireland who have diabetes, and most of it, as I say, is, is type 2. And the various figures are between 6% and 10% of our health budget is actually spent on managing diabetes. I always, people always get shocked when, when they hear that statistic because people think, well, cancer is probably a very expensive disease, but they don't tend to think of diabetes as being an expensive disease. But this shows you how expensive it is. And of course, most of that money is spent not on medication, it's actually spent on managing the complications of diabetes. So that's really the biggest challenge for us as people looking after people who have diabetes to try and prevent those complications. So this is looking at the worldwide prevalence of diabetes, and these are uh, information that was provided by the World Health Organization a few years ago. So you can see, I think it was in 2012 or 2011, there were 382 million people estimated to be living with diabetes worldwide. And 46% of those are undiagnosed. So if you think that the symptoms 
or bear in mind that the symptoms of type 2 diabetes come on very gradually, it's very difficult to diagnose. You know, if you don't have a suspicion or if the, the person themselves doesn't have an awareness of the symptoms and what the symptoms might mean, they can be undiagnosed for a long time. And it's estimated that it was 2013 that those uh, data were from. Between 2013 and 2035, you're going to see a massive increase, a 55% increase in the prevalence of diabetes worldwide. So it's going to be a huge problem. And it's not just in, you might imagine it's only in the United States or North America and Europe where we're relatively well off. But even in Africa, you, you can see it's estimated to be, to be over 100% increase in cases of diabetes in, the, in that 20 year time period. So what are the reasons for this? Well, obviously, the overweight and, uh, and obesity um, epidemic that we have seen is making a significant contribution to that. We really have increased our average body weight significantly over the last 20 years. We've also become a physically inactive species. And that's not just you know, going to the gym, but our, our life has changed so much. We depend on cars to go everywhere virtually. When I was young, we used to walk to school every day. I don't think children walk to school, and there's a number of reasons for that. Um, there may be security concerns, but also I think that just those kind of modifications in our lifestyle have led us to become much less active. And as you're all aware, the probably most common pastime of uh, the young generation these days is to be on some kind of a machine, pressing the little buttons, even at very young ages. So I think that's led to a very sedentary lifestyle, and that's all having an impact. And of course, our diets are, are increasingly unhealthy, and unfortunately, the least healthy foods tend to be the cheaper foods. So I mentioned body mass index, and I think everybody should actually know what their body mass index is. And if you don't have a, the ability to measure your height and weight at home, anytime you go to your doctor's surgery, next time you go to your GP, ask your GP to calculate your body mass index so you know where you are. And the normal body mass index is between 20 and 25. If you're between 25 and 30, we say that you're overweight. And once you're over 30, well then we say that you're obese. And as I said, the proportion of our population has increased substantially, the proportion that's in the obese category in the last uh, 20, 25 years. Almost two thirds of our population now are either overweight or obese. So a very important question, you know, I've told you all the bad news that the diabetes epidemic we're seeing, the rates are increasing, the rates are projected to increase for the next 20 years. So that begs the question, is there anything that we can do about that? And that's an important question. So, can we prevent diabetes? Well, for type 1 diabetes, we don't really fully understand the process that leads to its development, and any attempts to prevent type 1 diabetes have been pretty unsuccessful so far. But type 2 diabetes, intuitively, you would think, might be easier, in principle anyway, to prevent because we feel that physical inactivity and being overweight are two of the major factors that contribute to it, and that's something we can, in an ideal world, we can, we can modify. So for any condition to be preventable, we need to be able to identify people who are at risk of developing the condition. And we, we, do, we are able to do that in people with diabetes because a blood sugar doesn't go from being a normal level to being a high level overnight. There are all different grades of, of blood sugar between what's normal and even what's diabetes. So there's also what we call pre-diabetes. So we have a normal level of sugar, we have pre-diabetes, and then there's diabetes. And at the stage where there's pre-diabetes, where the sugar is a little high but not quite at seven, we can identify those people just by measuring their, their glucose in the fasting state. And we also know that there are certain people who are, over, who are at a particularly high risk of developing type 2 diabetes, so you can guess some of these yourselves at this stage, those who are overweight and obese, people with a family history of diabetes, women who have had diabetes during pregnancy, people who are physically inactive, certain ethnic groups are particularly prone to diabetes, so people of African, American Indian, Asian origin are more prone to diabetes, type 2 diabetes, than Caucasian people. I've mentioned a link of type 2 diabetes with high blood pressure, but also high cholesterol. So GPs are now very aware of this. So if they have a patient who's coming into them with their blood pressure or with their cholesterol, they're always checking in for diabetes and picking up more and more cases. And anybody over the age of 45, we know that diabetes increases in prevalence with increasing age. And that, again, is probably because we tend to gain weight as we get a little older, and we also tend to become less active. So all of these are risk factors for diabetes, and that means that we can screen people, we can test people who fall into one, of these, one or more of these categories to see if they have a normal 
sugar level or if their sugar level is starting to creep up or if maybe they're already in the diabetic range and didn't know it. But if we can find those who don't have diabetes yet, they're the target population to prevent. And we know from studies, I'll show you one of the, res the results from one of the studies in a minute, that type 2 diabetes can be prevented. And the ways to do it are to lose weight, to take regular exercise, and that may just be walking, a brisk walk for 30 minutes a day. Eating healthier foods, so less of the fatty foods, you know, burgers, fries, crisps, sweet foods, all the things that are, taste really, really good. And eating more fiber, fruit and vegetables, whole grain alternatives, so whole grain bread, whole grain rice instead of the white bread and the white rice, all these things are healthier options. Cutting down alcohol consumption, because remember alcohol has a lot of calories, and so that can contribute significantly to, to weight gain. So we, if we adopt these changes to our lifestyle, we know that type 2 diabetes can be prevented. And the ultimate aim, obviously, is to prevent the complications. But the first step is to prevent the, the disease. So these are data from a study that was carried out in Finland um, just 12 or 13 years ago, the, the study was reported. And basically what they did was they instituted those changes. So they asked the people to exercise for 30 minutes a day. They asked them to try and lose some weight. They asked them to modify their diet, to increase the fiber and cut down the fat and so on. And what they found was that, so you can see the difference here. So these people were much more likely to develop diabetes as the study went on than those who had the lifestyle intervention, made those lifestyle changes. And they actually had five particular changes they want people to introduce in their lives. And anybody in this study who adopted all five of those changes did not develop diabetes. And these were all people from that we, the, the study coordinators knew were at high risk of developing type 2 diabetes. So it's a very important study. But I suppose one of the criticisms was of this study uh, was that it's only done in Finland. And Finland has a very homogeneous population. It's mostly people of, of Finnish origin who are white, obviously. So there was a, a study done in the United States a couple of years later where they had different ethnic groups and it, the conclusion was the same, that if you adopt these healthy lifestyle changes, you can reduce the chances of developing type 2 diabetes. And the risk reduction there is 58%. So almost three-fifths of people who were at risk of diabetes were protected by making these changes in their lifestyle. So very important information. Now if we turn to the complications, so I've mentioned them already. So diabetic retinopathy is what we call the, the eye damage from diabetes. And diabetes is the commonest cause of blindness in the working age population in most Western countries, certainly in Ireland. And obviously as you get on in years, other things like macular de degeneration become more important. Um, but certainly in the younger age, working age population, diabetes is the commonest cause. Diabetes is the commonest cause of end-stage kidney disease. So people who need to go on dialysis or people who need kidney transplants, the commonest reason for that to happen is because of complications of diabetes. Diabetic neuropathy means that the nerves that supply the feet are damaged. Okay? So the result of that is that the sensation is lost from the feet. And if you don't feel normally in your feet, if you walk on a piece of glass, for instance, you feel nothing. And so that you can get a cut and that can develop into an infection and ultimately can lead to, uh, if the infection gets very deep-seated, unfortunately some people end up with an amputation. So diabetes is a leading contributor to amputation. And then heart disease and stroke, what we call cardiovascular disease, is more common in people with type 2 diabetes. So there's a two to four-fold higher rate of cardiovascular diseases in people with type 2 diabetes. And this is one of the reasons that, unfortunately, people with diabetes, they don't look after themselves. This is one of the reasons that they might die as a result of the complications. So another important question, I've told you that type 2 diabetes can be prevented. But another important question is, if you have the complications, can those complications be prevented? And insulin was discovered in about 90 years ago now, just over 90 years ago. But it took up until 1993, so that was 70 years, for a good study to show conclusively in people with type 1 diabetes that giving them the insulin was able to prevent the long-term complications of type 1 diabetes. And in 1998, a similar study in type 2 diabetes was reported for the first time, really conclusively showing that if we control the blood sugar very well in people with type 2 diabetes, we can prevent the complications. So it's very important for people who have diabetes to know what their blood sugars are, and that's why we give them a little machine. So most people with diabetes will be checking their sugars a number of times in the course of a day. And 
the frequency with which they need to check their sugars depends on whether they're on insulin and what their treatment is. But most people will have that little machine so they can inform themselves and give useful information to us as healthcare professionals looking after them about what their blood sugar levels do. And, and these are very useful devices because what patients can do if they're interested, they can check their sugar before a meal and after a meal and see what effect a particular type of food has on their blood sugar levels. They can monitor their sugar before and after exercise and see what effect the exercise has on their blood sugar levels. And this really trains them to understand their own body's reaction to the, the, the factors that can uh, impact on their blood sugar level. Well, in addition to having those finger stick tests, and that tells an individual what their sugar is at that instant. So it's only five minutes later the sugar could be different. But when we're looking at, uh, when they come to see us, for advice on their diabetes, we need to know what their sugar is doing over a longer period of time. And this is why we have something called the A1C, which tells us what their blood sugar has been on average over the preceding three months. And, and when somebody comes to see me, that's the first thing I look at to determine whether their blood sugar is controlled. And then if it's not controlled, I look at their finger stick readings to see, well, at what time of the day are they high and what do I need to do about that? But this is a study, this is a slide from that study in type two diabetes. And what it shows here, um, this is the HbA1c, which is an average of the blood sugar control, and it's just increasing as you come along the x-axis here, and then on the y-axis is the likelihood of developing complications. That's what the microvascular endpoints is. And you can see that as the HbA1c increases, the likelihood of complications increases. So that's why we want to know what the HbA1c is. And we like to see it down around 7 down here, because there isn't much of a risk of them developing complications at that level. So this is the A1C, it's a blood test that measures the amount of glucose that has been incorporated into the hemoglobin. That's, a, that's the protein that carries oxygen in our blood. And it stays in the blood for as long as the, the, the cell that contains it is around, which is about three months. And that tells us the average sugar over the preceding three months has been at a particular level. So you can't fool this test. So let's say you're going to the doctor in a week's time, you say, okay, I'll be good for the next week and go in with very good blood sugar readings. If you haven't been taking your medication, if you haven't been doing your exercise and watching your diet, this test will, will still be elevated, even if you've been good for a week beforehand. And obviously then, if somebody has an infection and their blood sugar goes high for a, a short period of time, again, that doesn't tend to affect this level. The normal level is between four and six, and as you see from the previous slide, we like to see it down around seven, at, at least, in, in, in people with diabetes. So again, this is, a, this is a, a slide from that study in type 2 diabetes showing that the complications could be prevented. And you can see the treatment, the, there were two groups in this study, one who were treated very aggressively and one that were treated less aggressively. And you can see that there's a difference right over the 10 years of the study in the HbA1c and the aggressively treated group compared to the less aggressively treated group. Now, there's only about 1% of a difference. We don't think that that's huge but it's significant if it's maintained over a long period of time. And this is a, a slide from the, essentially showing the same thing, the relationship of the HbA1c to complications from the type 1 study that I mentioned earlier on. So it's very important information for us to be able to say to patients, you know, it is critical to control your blood sugar levels. And it, these two studies are really what we refer to on a daily basis to inform patients that the importance of controlling their blood sugar levels to prevent these complications in the longer term. So this is a very complicated slide, but I put it in just for a reason to show you how sophisticated the treatment of type 2 diabetes is becoming now. So remember I said that the body becomes res resistant to insulin. Well, the muscle cells and the fat cells are the cells that really respond to insulin, and they're the tissues that become resistant to insulin in people who develop type 2 diabetes. Now, the liver is also important. So the liver makes sugar, and it can make it a little bit too much in people with type 2 diabetes. And then I've mentioned the pancreas, which makes the insulin. And as you, you recall, I said that the insulin level is not adequate for the person's needs. And then another tissue that's important is the kidney up there on the right. So the kidney, because more sugar is passing out in the urine in somebody with diabetes, the kidney starts to reabsorb more sugar. Okay? So it's a very complicated process. In type 1 diabetes, we, we view it as being quite simple. The insulin-making cells are damaged. There's no insulin. There really aren't any other organs involved. But you can see here in type 2 diabetes, it involves the muscle, it involves the fat, it involves the liver, it involves the pancreas, it involves the kidney. So it's a very, very complicated process in terms of what's going wrong in the body. But we, 
don't worry about the names of these drugs, but I'm just going to show you the sort of approach we can take now to people with type 2 diabetes. So we have drugs that can work on this insulin resistance and make the body more sensitive to insulin. Okay? So that has uh, clearly got a potential benefit for people with type 2 diabetes. If you make their body more, resistant, more sensitive to insulin, their blood sugars improve and their requirement for insulin goes down. We have drugs that work here on the pancreas, and what they do is stimulate the pancreas to make more insulin. So if you recall, I said that in the first stage of, diabetes, of type 2 diabetes, the pancreas can make more insulin, but that process eventually fails. But we have drugs that can actually try and revive the pancreas and, and make more insulin. Again, we have another group of drugs here that work on the liver. So I said the liver makes too, a little bit too much sugar in people with type 2 diabetes. Well, this group of drugs can work on the liver and stop them making too much sugar. Then we have, I didn't mention the, the intestine, but there's a group of drugs also that reduce the amount of glucose that we or sugar that we absorb from our diets. That has a clear potential benefit. And then the most recently introduced uh, group, uh, group of drugs in the, uh, for type 2 diabetes work on the kidney. So I said the kidney absorbs too much sugar in people with type 2 diabetes. And now we can actually reduce that with this latest group of drugs. We can actually reduce the amount of sugar that's, re that's taken up by the kidney. And of course, that's going to lower the blood sugar level. So you can see we have a very complex process of abnormality leading to type 2 diabetes, but we now have different drugs that can address those different abnormalities that do lead to the sugar rising. And because they all work in different tissues, in different parts of the body, they can work together very well. So we might have somebody who's taking one of these drugs to shut off the liver production of glucose, as well as something to make the pancreas make more glucose make more insulin, sorry. And they all tend to work very well together and we use them in all sorts of different combinations. I mentioned the blood pressure being very commonly a problem also in people with type 2 diabetes. For us as people looking after people with diabetes, it's very important for us to remember that the complications are not all only impacted by the blood sugar. So the sugar is very important but the blood pressure and the cholesterol are also very important. So we always measure uh, the blood pressure when our or people come to visit us for their annual visit or their biannual visit, whatever it is. We, we like to see the blood pressure less than 140 over 80. So we have lots of information now to say we can prevent the complications. So they can be prevented by controlling the blood sugar levels. That involves sticking to the diet, taking regular exercise, taking medication as prescribed. If we control the blood pressure, that's beneficial. And that's, again, through diet, exercise, reducing salt intake and prescribing medication. Controlling the cholesterol, again diet's important here, exercise is important and there are very good drugs that can bring down the cholesterol, you've probably heard of statins, that's what we use. People who smoke, smoking causes many of the same complications as diabetes, so that's something we can stop and hopefully improve. And then there's some evidence that aspirin is beneficial even in people who don't have any complications from, from diabetes, taking aspirin might be beneficial in terms of preventing them. So I think that's as far as uh, I wanted to go. Just some useful websites, anybody who's interested in learning a bit more about diabetes. Diabetes Federation of Ireland has got a very good website with lots of information about services for people with diabetes and also information about the condition itself, information of where to seek help if you need it. Um, there's also the American Diabetes Association, the Irish Nutrition and Dietetic Association, and uh, the Juvenile Diabetes, which is really for people with type 1 diabetes. So I'll stop there and be very happy to take any questions anybody has. There's one behind you there. Um, well, I think certainly for, for the major va cardiovascular complications, yes. I mean, that's, I think, pretty well accepted. I'm not aware of any information to suggest that they have independent, independent effects on the microvascular complications of diabetes or sugar-related complications. One of the things that's emerged over recent years with the... So statins are very, very widely used now. We had a talk from Michael Barry, who's um, from uh, the group in Trinity, who regulate the try to control the prices of, of medications in the country and uh
it's, it's amazing how much money we spend on individual drugs, but uh, the statins are amongst the most commonly pre uh, prescribed drugs in the country. And uh, as we've more experience with them, one of the things that has emerged is that in people who don't have diabetes, they seem to cause the sugar to rise a little bit. Uh, so this led to this suggestion that statins might be causing diabetes. I don't think that's a major factor contributing to the epidemic of diabetes. And the beneficial effects of the statins in terms of reducing the chances of a heart attack and stroke certainly outweigh any slight rise that might occur in the blood sugar level. Um, so we're still learning, I think, about them, and there's probably still a lot we don't understand about them, but I'm not aware of any information that suggests it has an independent effect on... on um, there is some evidence that fibrates, which we use to control triglycerides, may have some independent beneficial effects on some of the microvascular complications. Yeah. Can I ask you one about the nutrition diet? Um, of the macronutrients, um, we're talking about insulin levels, what causes the blood sugar levels to rise most, would you say? So the predominant one would be glucose, the sugar, and all the carbohydrates that you take in. So carbohydrates are basically, they're built, uh, building individual lengths of, of glucose or sugar molecules. So bread, potatoes, rice, pasta will eventually all be broken down into individual sugar molecules before it's absorbed into your system. Uh, so that's, glucose would be the predominant stimulus for insulin release. But uh, amino acids, which are the breakdown products of protein, are also known to stimulate insulin release. And, and some of the breakdown products of fat can do it as well under certain circumstances. So, but I would think that glucose is the most important, the sugar is the most important. I just feel that people's Irish diets are very, very high in carbohydrates, which is a high driver for blood sugar glucose levels. Um, so I wonder why would they not be cut back rather so than fat? Why would fat be demonized or vilified rather than the carbohydrates approach? Okay, so, well, very often the carbohydrate content is, so if you go to a dietitian, when you're diagnosed with diabetes, the dietitian will probably tell you that about 50% of your diet should be, your energy should be from carbohydrate, about 35% from fat and about 15% from protein. And very often people are up to 60 or 70% of carbohydrate. Um, but the fats are obviously very bad. The fats, are, are very much linked to the cardiovascular complications of diabetes. So certain types of fat promote the heart attack and stroke um, more so than, the, than the probably sugar does. So that's why... Would we be talking trans fats there, saturated fats? Which yeah, fats, yeah, fats yeah. So, so it's, it's important to look at the different types of, of uh, um, different macronutrients, as you say, and as I say, 50% carbohydrate, 35% fat, and 15% protein. Just, I, I've read a lot on the ketogenic diet. I, I don't know whether you're a fake with the ketogenic diet. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've seen a lot of people on that. I, I mean, to be honest, we probably. I'm not going to say it's it's not that it should be um, outlawed. Um, people definitely lose weight on a ketogenic diet where they take in a lot of fat. Uh, look at the blood sugar levels, though. Or if you look at the blood sugar levels on a ketogenic diet, the more easily managed. Yeah, well, if you, so you lose a lot of weight. Um, one of the effects of losing a lot of weight is that your body will become much more sensitive to insulin. It'll make your diabetes easier to control. And very often, actually, if people lose enough weight and we remeasure their blood sugar levels, their blood sugar levels will be normal, so they will look like they don't have diabetes at all. Um, so the long term, the concern, I suppose, as professionals, and I think a dietitian will probably say the same, give you the same answer, is that we don't have enough long-term data with these diets to say that the high fat intake in that situation doesn't have deleterious or you know, damaging long-term. Sorry? There's simply not enough research done on There are a lot of short-term studies, you know, maybe out to a year, year and a half, but what you need are like 10, 15, 20-year uh, studies to say that these diets are safer in the longer term. Yeah. Uh, I wonder if that uh, Irish people has big problems about diet, you know, yeah. we told about. Uh, why did you change your uh, diet habits here? Because everybody likes uh, too much potatoes. I realize that here. <laughs> and uh, I want to ask you about uh, how can, why did you uh, put potato in the vegetable uh, group, in the food label, you know, food pyramids? And uh, why did it you uh, put it uh, uh, in the carbohydrates foods, in you know uh, flour, uh, bread, as uh, equally the bread like this? It's not vegetable because of the potato. It's not vegetable, you know. I will and get into a debate about whether. <laughs> I'm dietitian. I'm diabetic uh, dietitian also in 
Yeah, okay. Uh, I won't get into a debate about whether potato is a vegetable or not, but... Uh, um, so, yes, I mean, I think that the carbohydrates, there are other nutrients you get from eating potatoes you don't get from eating more processed carbohydrates. So I think that's probably why it's, it's set in a separate group in with the vegetable group. So people would like to see you consuming potatoes rather than white bread or white rice and so on. Yeah. Um, I, it probably is. I mean, there's, certain, there's, there's a lot of research going on in type 1 diabetes um, to understand what we call the epidemiology, to understand why it develops, and, and the object of doing that would be to try and prevent type, type 1 diabetes from um, occurring in the first place. So here in Ireland, certainly, there, there isn't a huge amount of research going on in type 1 diabetes, and most of the research in diabetes would be in type 2. Um, the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation, the bottom uh, of those uh, lists on the useful websites, I mean, that's the biggest uh, international funder of type 1 diabetes research, and they're doing a lot of type 1 diabetes research. Um, we've been trying to link up through Diabetes Federation of Ireland with them over, over recent years to see if we can access some of the funding to get some type 1 diabetes research going on here in Ireland. So we're continuing to work on that. Um, but certainly, I think the funding for diabetes research in Ireland is mostly towards uh, type, type, type 2. Um, in terms of resources for managing people with diabetes, I mean, we would say that we don't have enough resources for managing type 2 or type 1. I think the most difficult area probably for type 1 diabetes is in the young, in the, young you know, the adolescents and the children. I think the services are very sketchy if you're um, you know, under the age of 18 or 16 with type 1 diabetes. So that's an area that, you know, the, um, there's a group through the HSE working on that at the moment to try and... Um, improve the services for, for those people. I think we do the best of all the services we have available for, for the adult population, but you know, I, I think we, we, we would say we'd like more resources for dealing with both type 1 and type 2. I think it's also important to protect you know, type 1. You, you get a lot of negative press, I suppose, because of the association with the epidemic of diabetes, with obesity and so on. You get a lot of negative press for type 2 diabetes. And I know that that irks people with type 1 diabetes because uh, people tend to look at them and say, oh, you got diabetes, well, it's your own fault. Now, that's obviously not a way we should look at any, any kind of uh, condition. But that, it does happen um, that uh, people with type 1 diabetes feel that they're kind of, if you like, tarred with the brush of, of diabetes. We've got very limited experience using pumps in type 2 diabetes, but uh, so... Would that be less common to, to use them for type 2? Much less common, yeah. Much yeah. Well, so, no, actually people with type 2 diabetes who need insulin generally will need actually more insulin than because their bodies are quite insulin resistant. So they might need twice as much insulin as somebody with type 1 diabetes. Um, but they're very often when they start with type 2 diabetes, when we start them with insulin, might be one injection a day whereas it's a much more elaborate regime in people with type, two, with type 1, where they're usually on four insulin injections a day. And um, there are advantages for using the pump. It doesn't suit everybody. We, we try to carefully select anybody we recommend the pump for um, because you know, there's an upside and a downside to everything. So you have to very carefully select who goes on a pump. But there's very, I mean, we're just really starting to look at the area of using the pump in type 2 diabetes because I suppose we're seeing more diabetes, we're seeing more more type 2, we're seeing more type 2 who require insulin and who require more insulin and we're using more elaborate regimes now, particularly in the younger age population. So I'd say in the next 10 to 15 years you'll see more data coming out on using the pumps in type 2. There's a question at the back that we've been trying to get for a while. Okay. Uh, the second one 
target water the uh, blood uh, water the blood can cure a target of this to this kind of Okay, so, so that's a very good question because a lot of medications, this not only in diabetes, are eliminated from the body through the kidneys. And so when the kidneys are not working as they previously were, and somebody's got kidney failure, then the, the drugs can build up in the system and we have to be very careful with what we use. So um, the tablet that we use most commonly in type 2 diabetes works very well in people who are overweight. It doesn't cause any problems with their weight and actually usually makes most people lose a bit of weight. But we need to be very careful using that in people with kidney failure because once the kidneys get beyond a certain point, it can cause uh, potentially serious complications. So we would try where possible to control with tablets. And there are tablets that are safe, you know, but although we often need to use a lower dose in the kidney failure patients. Um, but we, we have a lot of experience with insulin as well in, in people with kidney failure and you know I'd have no problem using insulin in somebody with kidney failure you just need to be again careful with the dose and, and we feel I suppose in some ways we feel more comfortable using insulin in people with kidney failure. Um, on the second question the target for the blood sugar control it really depends so it, there, there's no set target you can say you can apply to everybody I mentioned the HbA1c test and how we like to see the number down around 7. But having said that, that's not necessarily the case for everybody. Some people we might like it to be 6.5, some people we might like it to be 6, other people we might be happy with is 8. So we know that people who have a lot of uh, complications, uh, people who have heart disease, people who have kidney disease, sometimes it's, it's not good for them to have their sugar levels too tightly controlled because it makes them more prone to you know, low blood sugars with the medication and so on. So we have to be very careful to, to um, evaluate everybody as an individual and decide what is the best treatment for them. So, you know, if you have any concern about your father, just have a chat with his doctor and, and uh, get, you know, make sure the doctor is evaluating his overall risk factor profile and comes to a tailored uh, target for him. Well, yeah, so that's a good question. I mean, we say prevent because the studies were carried out for a defined period of time and it didn't develop in, as you saw, 60% of those patients. They weren't followed necessarily to see whether they, some of them obviously, I mean, there is a follow-up study and some of them do develop diabetes. So I suppose in a sense it's delaying it. Um, but I think if you maintain those lifestyle changes in the long term, because once the study is finished, people no longer man necessarily maintain the lifestyle changes and they're not getting the same kind of... Um, intensive advice from dietitians and exercise people they would have gotten during the study. So essentially the study is at an end and they're more likely to develop diabetes again. Um, so it's a, it's a question probably we should really say we're delaying the onset of diabetes rather than preventing it. Um, and the treatment then for diabetes, I don't know if you were asking me about medication, but the medications that we use for, type, for treating type 2 diabetes, many of them have been studied in people with pre-diabetes and the medications as well can prevent the onset of diabetes, although not as successfully as the diet and exercise. Yeah. Sometimes. Sometimes. Yeah. It's not necessary most of the time. I mean, there are different criteria for diagnosing diabetes. So there are, we use four now. One is the fasting glucose that I mentioned. One is an HbA1c. So if that's over 6.5% or 48 millimoles per mole, we can diagnose diabetes now. Or, uh, we can use postprandial. You can use postprandial, yeah. Or, so which, if it's greater than... Or, do you use milligrams per deciliter or millimoles? So 11.1. And then a, a random glucose as well, if people have symptoms of diabetes, a random glucose. And very often, if you think of it, the person with diabetes is go going to present to their GP most likely. If they come into the GP saying, I'm feeling very thirsty, I'm losing weight, and the GP says, well, you're not fast, well, I'll check a blood sugar level. So if that's high, if it's over 11.1, then that's a, a diagnostic criterion for diabetes. But they should come back and have a fasting done as well, just to confirm. You've been reading all the political questions, have you? <laughs> Probably not. Um, you know, well, it depends on the individual person. Some people don't want to. 
Okay? Um, we would advise anybody who's on a medication that can cause a low blood sugar. So anybody who's on insulin, we would say yes, they should be on it, using a glucometer and they should be checking the sugar a number of times a day, probably four as a minimum. Um, any of the medications that work on the pancreas and cause the pancreas to make more insulin have the potential for causing low blood sugars. So people taking those medications, we would always advise that they check the sugars at least once a day. Um, but people who are taking some medications that are, have a low potential for causing a low blood sugar, which is the main concern um, of the treatments of diabetes, it, it, it's probably not necessary for them to use a glucometer. And it's a very thorny subject because uh, the glucometers themselves don't cost a lot of money, but the strips that you put in cost a lot of money, and that costs, uh, if you talk, go and talk to Michael Barry, who I was talking to, yes, gave us a talk yesterday about drugs, he'll tell you that those glucometer strips are very, very expensive. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank you.